With the recent release of Play Dead's Inside, the game has left many players wondering what the hell just happened, and if there was some sort of story they missed. Now, while I definitely don't claim that my interpretation of the plot is the one true way to see it, and I've read a few theories that are just as good, I've spent some time picking apart the details of the game and feel somewhat confident with the conclusions I've made. Now, one thing to note, my interpretation of the story assumes that Inside does have a story, and assumes that the story is somewhat literal and not metaphorical in its form. Lastly, this is obviously going to spoil the game pretty heavily, so I'd recommend that you play the game first, as it's quite an experience. So, with that in mind, here is what I think the plot to Inside is. In this world, at some point there was a massive flood. This flood consumed a large portion of the world and forced the higher powers of the government to scramble for solutions. The flood may even still be ongoing, and may have come in waves as evidenced by the multiple layers of facilities, though they could just be multiple facilities built at the same time that succumbed at different points to the immense depths of the water. With vast quantities of water covering the world, this caused civilization to build upwards. By constructing cities on top of cities and creating artificial land masses to climb ever upwards, they were able to hold off the waters a bit longer. Civilization is collected into large, walled-off city structures that are interconnected by raised tramways, as most of the ground is unsafe to travel except by government officials. These city structures not only protect against rising waters for a period of time, and allow for infrastructure to divert water, but they also may serve the function of building blocks, as I'll cover later. While civilization still exists, it is in a tenuous position at best. Even now, in the city seen at the start of the game, many people are fleeing due to another potential flood or to construct a new and improved city to survive. With such dangerous conditions, the government seized totalitarian control and created four different solutions to ensure humanity's survival, with each solution building off of another and culminating into the final one seen in the game. The first stage, and the one that impacts most of the others, involves the parasites the flood brought. These parasites seize mental control of an organism and cause it to become extremely hostile. In addition, these parasites thrive in water and begin to replicate at an incredible rate in the waterlogged state of the world. There are some other aspects of the parasites as well, but I'll address those as they become relevant. With these new parasites, the government begins to experiment with mind control. Mind control will allow for the upper class to thrive, while the lower class toils on the superstructures that ensure their survival. In addition, by creating a lower class of mind drones, the upper class can abandon human ethics in an effort to find more outlandish solutions to the flood problem. At this point, the government needs to find a way to massively incapacitate the population to allow for them to have their minds wiped so that they can be controlled later. One possible solution to the problem is the shockwave weapon found deep underground, which may have just been an experimental weapon that was never fully utilized. Although, the shockwave could just as easily be a deterrent to keep people and creatures away from the innermost depths of the testing facilities, or could have other applications I haven't fully considered such as stemming the flood in some way. Regardless, the government eventually opts to use automated shock coil drones that can target the lower class while posing no threat to the elites. The drones are able to differentiate between the upper and lower classes by the masks that the upper class wears when in areas that the drones operate. Once subdued, the lower classes are put into sensory deprivation tanks that put them into a permanent sleeping state. From here, the mind control helmets can emit a frequency of some sort that manipulates these sleepers to do the operator's bidding, or trick some sort of implanted parasite into thinking they are responding to the head of the mass, with the parasite subdued due to the water tanks. Some of these tanks are piped upwards to the sky in case another flood comes, or additional levels of cityscape are required. Another possibility is that the parasites were an epidemic of massive proportions, and the government is gathering infected citizens to subdue the normally aggressive parasites, and they are so hostile towards the player because they are afraid of another outbreak. Though I think this is less likely than the government being a malicious totalitarian force. While the first stage of the project is a success, the mind control is primitive and requires a single operator to be in relative proximity to its targets in order to manipulate them effectively. Regardless, the second stage of experiments is created to explore other options for survival. This stage involves creating microbiomes to sustain civilization in the flood, and also to create trees that mature and grow at an extremely rapid rate, as shown by the tree that punctured glass, and may even be able to have their growth controlled via some form of implant. This allows for huge amounts of fuel to be harvested to power the furnaces and the labs, and also as a potential form of support for upper levels of city structures. With fuel and workers no longer a major concern, the scientists begin to search for ways to create an artificial life form that can survive underwater, perhaps as a way to augment workforces by creating an underwater operator or a set of drones, or even as a potential endgame solution to the issue of the floods entirely. 
These forms are raised from an extremely young age and created via an umbilical implant that changes their biological makeup, allowing them to breathe underwater and influence mind drones without need of a helmet. While again, the third stage of experiments are successful, they are not explored further due to the value they introduce with their underwater breathing and helmetless control capabilities. After studying the parasites, the scientists discover that individual parasites act as a part of a whole. They instinctively seek out stronger or larger bodies to group up with and create powerful amalgamations. With this information in mind, and the success of the third stage experiments, scientists begin the fourth stage to create a human-parasite hybrid that can be cultivated in water and can group together to create a powerful master node to control multiple mind drones at once from great distance to perform more focused tasks that will reduce the struggle to outbuild the floods. Early stages of this experiment involve individuals being monitored in observation rooms while they develop, their progress and growth under careful scrutiny. However, over time, the hybridization causes massive physical deformations and create horrifying nerve reactions in individual body parts, potentially making them act on their own, and require the subjects to be cultivated in large-scale breeding pools, similar to the sensory deprivation tanks, while they fully mature. Another possible reason for these breeding pools is that due to the propensity for the hybrids to split apart, new replacement bodies would be needed to augment the master node over time. To help facilitate breeding pools that can be monitored effectively, gravitational control of water is developed on a small scale, with again the possibility of an endgame solution to the flood being a secondary objective. While the experiments have been going on for some time, there has never been a successful master node cultivated before the waters consume the facility, as seen by the remains of old facilities throughout the game. But, with the steady crawl of advancement over time, a master node is finally close to completion in the facility towards the end of the game. At this point, for some reason, someone within the upper echelons of scientists rebels. They secretly begin spying on the project and gathering as much data as they can in an attempt to undermine it. Whoever this person is, they enjoy listening to a particular piece of music, which is what led me to believe in this connection. To enact their plan, this person flees to the countryside and sets up a shelter to hide themselves from any would-be pursuers. Along the way, they create a node relay that can broadcast mind control fields over a greater distance and feed them into a central command point. From this position, they can control an agent to infiltrate the facility and stop the project before it can completely subsume the lower ranks of society and potentially halt the harsh experimentation entirely. The agent they choose for the infiltration is the child we play in the game. Depending on what we as the player choose, we can either liberate the master node and stop the project from reaching its full conclusion, or we disconnect the mind control relay and finally the main control node entirely, giving up on the attempt. Where this true operator is, is not entirely clear. Are they within the final node, hence why we do not see what is inside? Or are they somewhere else entirely? One possible explanation is that the operator is the player themselves, and the whole game is a bizarre meta-narrative, but since I am choosing to believe a more literal interpretation of the game, I choose to ignore this possibility. There are also a few other questions I don't have completely solid answers for. Why do the animals in the game flock to us and act somewhat intelligently, as seen with the fish disconnecting the stage 3 genetic implant that allows us to breathe underwater? One possible conclusion is that the animals, much like the mind drones, are drawn to the mind control waves due to their extremely weak minds, and since we are being controlled by a network relay, they may pick up on the signal and group around us. Or maybe the animals detect that the child is somehow related to the parasites and are seeking him for food, with the fish being conditioned by the scientists for some reason, as there seem to be some fish within the facilities proper. Another question is whether or not society is building upwards to escape the flood, or if they are building upwards because they are sinking down. The final shot shows us in a vast expanse of grey, and while it is possible it could just be the horizon, it is also not too far outside the realm of possibility that we are in an underground cavern, as the shockwave facility was also a large sandy stretch of land far beneath the surface. And relating to this, are the numbers shown throughout the game denoting the particular experiment, or are they denoting individual facilities, with the fourth being the most recent one developed while the others have long since succumbed to the floods? Either are plausible, and both show that the experiments have been going on for some time. Regardless, I don't claim that any of my interpretations are true fact, but I felt like sharing in case you had literally no idea where to even begin parsing the weird imagery shown in the game. There are plenty of other ideas that are just as valid as these, and, in truth, never knowing the true answer is half the fun.